everyone and thanks for coming back to our channel. I'm Elizabeth. Well, I got another case for you guys and it's Friday. But before we get started, please take a moment and hit the like, subscribe and the bell to get notified when we upload other case videos. Today, this is the case of Melvin Ignato. Melvin was born on March 26, 1938. He was living in Kentucky where he had grown up. He did land a job working for an import and export company that was based out of Asia. He was making good money at this time and he did marry and had three children, but they had gotten a divorce. After the divorce, he did wind up getting a 32-foot speedboat and even a Corvette. Then in 1986, he went on a blind date. Then he met a beautiful woman named Brenda, Sue Schaefer. She was a nursing assistant and they ended up in a relationship. Friends of the 36-year-old Brenda described her as naive. She was known for being attractive to older, wealthy men. Melvin fit her ideal man. He had money and he was 50 years old. She was making $7.50 an hour for being a nurse's assistant. Melvin's income was much more than hers, and she was very impressed of how much he made. Melvin had given Brenda a 2.3 carat diamond engagement ring on Valentine's Day in 1987. This made her thrilled and wanted to marry him. Like many lovers, they wanted to be happy and live happy ever after, but not this one. It did, however, in the relationship went bad and Brenda had said that Melvin was mistreating her and that he was repulsive and she had planned on leaving him. She had been seeing an ex-boyfriend of hers and was cheating on Melvin. So how does a man get revenge when he is being cheated on? Yep, you guessed it. So, in 1988, Melvin had got a harebrained idea to murder Brenda. He wanted to get back at her for cheating on him. Now, Melvin asked a former girlfriend to help him. Her name was Marianne Shore. They had planned to kill Brenda in Mary's home. They spent weeks of planning the perfect murder. They had dug a grave for Brenda, and they also made sure they did a screen test so that they know that nobody could hear Brenda's screams while they murdered her. Then in September 23, 1988, Brenda had went over to see Melvin to return some of his jewelry that he had given her. He had told her that he wanted to do sex therapy classes with her, so he took her to Mary's house. And then she wanted to leave Mary's house. And that is when Melvin had pulled a gun on her and then proceeded to tie her up. He tied her to a glass table and then he raped and choked her, sodomized her for hours, also tortured her as well. He had done this for several hours too, before he finally ended her torture and murdered her with chloroform. Mary had taken pictures of the crime while Brenda was being sexually assaulted and tortured by Melvin and Mary had also participated in it too. After murdering, they both had taken Brenda in the backyard and put her in that hole that they had dug for Brenda. They did take Brenda's jewelry. Melvin had taken Brenda's jewelry and a roll of the film and placed it in a plastic bag. He then took the plastic bag and hid it in the floor vent in his house in the hallway. He used a tape to tape it up inside the vent so no one could easily find it. Now Brenda was reported missing the following day and the police started an investigation. They did find her 1986 Buick Regal in the morning and it was abandoned on the shoulder of the Interstate 64 in Louisville, Kentucky. It had a flat tire and a broken window. The police had spoken to Melvin about Brenda being missing and he told them he saw Brenda and the last time that he saw her was at 11 p.m. on September 23rd and she was alive and well. The police had a feeling that Melvin was not telling the truth. Somehow he might have been involved in Brenda's being missing. 
but without a body, nor Melvin confessing, and no physical evidence tying to her being missing or even dead, they could not arrest him. But the police did trick Melvin by telling Melvin that he could clear his name by going to a grand jury. Melvin did go, and in the testimony, he talked about a woman named Mary Ann Shore who could give his alibi. This was the first time the police had heard of the name Mary Ann Shore. It was new information, so they went and called Mary to testify. So Mary did come and she said that she saw Brenda Schaefer just on one occasion. Then the prosecutor had asked Mary, what did Brenda look like? Then Mary responded, you mean the last time I saw her? The prosecutor had that meant Mary saw Brenda more than just once. The prosecutor jumped at this chance. He had questioned her about this. Mary had literally fled the witness stand by running out of the courthouse. If this shows Mary's guilt, I don't know what could. It did not take long when the police had interviewed Mary and she wound up confessing to it all. The planning of the murder, the grave, she also told them she had taken pictures too. She did say that she was not in the room when Melvin did the actual murder of Brenda. Then on January 10th, 1989, Mary did show the investigators where Brenda's body was in the backyard. The police had thought that maybe there would be evidence on Brenda's body that would connect her death to Melvin. By the time they found the body, any DNA that could have been on her and the fluids had degraded too much to even give a match to tie Melvin to her murder. Even though they did have Mary for first degree murder and of course many other charges, they knew that Melvin was truly the mastermind behind killing Brenda. They knew that Melvin was a very serious and dangerous person. They weren't really interested in getting Mary for the murder of Brenda. They wanted the real killer. They offered Mary an incredible deal that if she testifies against Melvin, they would get, just get her for tampering with evidence charge. She took the deal. By this time, the FBI was involved. They did wire up Mary to record Melvin, hoping just a chance that he would incriminate himself by murdering Brenda. She went to see Melvin, hoping to get to start talking about the murder. She had told Melvin that the FBI had been hounding her. The police had told her to tell him that the property behind her house was going to be bought by a developer. So Mary did. She told him she was afraid that they would dig up the body and the ground and they would find Brenda. She wanted Melvin to help her find a solution on what to do with Brenda's body. The recordings did capture Melvin berating Mary about the FBI rattling her. And he said that it didn't matter who starts digging on the property because, quote, the place we dug was not shallow, unquote. He also told Mary that the FBI did not have anything against him. Now the prosecutors did listen to the recordings and were really confident that this would bring a conviction of murdering Brenda. They had arrested Melvin in January 11th, 1990 for the murder of Brenda. Melvin sold his home to pay for a defense and that he would, could not go back to the home to retrieve that evidence of the murder in the vent due to him being in prison and that somebody else is gonna be owning the home. The trial was set for December 1991. The state had a few problems right from the start. The jury had heard the recordings and could not make of what Melvin was saying. Quote, it's not shallow that place we dug, and it's not shallow, so don't let it get you rattled. Besides, that one area by where that site, it does not have any trees by it, unquote. The jury could not decide if the site or he said safe. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, the state had another problem. It was the behavior of Mary. She did not make a really good first impression on the jury. When Mary came in, she wore a small mini skirt, 
when she came to the testify, she had laughed when she was testifying that she had been offered a deal and that it was so incredibly enticing that it might lead to deception. The jury had felt that Mary was out for revenge on Melvin. The defense stated that it was Mary who had killed Brenda and she acted alone. After all, Brenda's body was at Mary's house, not at Melvin's. When the jury came back, they did find Melvin not guilty on all charges. He was set free. This upset the judge so much because they found him not guilty that he had wrote a letter to the family of Brenda and made an apology. Her parents had died before the trial had begun. Now, according to the family and some friends, they had died of a broken heart due to Brenda being murdered. The federal government wasn't finished. They started pursuing a case against Melvin for perjury. In October 1st, 1992, it was just a week before the trial, the new owners of Melvin's house made a new discovery in the hallway while they were pulling up the old carpet to lay the new carpet in. The carpet layer had found a vent that contained the plastic bag with tape holding it inside. While he looked inside the bag, he found the jewelry of Brenda's he had taken from her the night of her disappearance and three rolls of undeveloped film, which when developed, it had 105 photos. The police were called and it was handed over to them. And when they did develop the film, it had the crime and it was being committed against Brenda. Just had like Mary had said to the investigators earlier, there was a man in the photos, but his face was not visible enough to actually make an identification. But the body of the man matched that of Melvin due to his body hair and patterns and of course moles that were visible. Now because of the double jeopardy, this had prevented him to being charged again for Brenda's murder. However, he was charged with federal charges for perjury when he committed when he went before the grand jury in his testimony. He had said he did not kill Brenda. In the reality, he did. Melvin admitted in court that he killed Brenda. He told her family that she died peacefully. Melvin was sentenced to eight years in prison for perjury. Then only five years of that eight was served. After his release, the state prosecuted him for additional perjury charges. In 1989, Brenda's employer had threatened to kill Melvin if he did not tell where Brenda's body was. This did a dump in trial and the employer was convicted of harassment. And in the trial, Melvin had said he did not kill Brenda. So this is where they got that perjury from. From this, Melvin was convicted again and was sentenced nine years. And out of the nine years, he had served only four and a half. He then was released again in 2006. Melvin moved to Louisville, Kentucky. He moved into an apartment and one of the neighbors had said that Melvin was not doing well mentally and physically, that he could hear Melvin scream for Jesus to come get him because he was in lots of pain. And then in September 1st, 2008, Melvin was 70 year old by then, that he was found dead by his neighbor in his apartment. It appeared that he must have fallen into the glass top coffee table and he was severely cut when the glass had broke. There was a bloody trail on the way to the kitchen and then from there it went into his bedroom and then he bled to death from the injuries he got when he fell. Melvis' son, Michael, admits, quote, he'll probably go down as one of the most hated men in Louisville Maybe it'll just put it to rest that we all don't have to keep dealing with this over and over. That's what I hope, unquote. Now, Mary was convicted of tampering with evidence. She was sentenced to five years in prison. She was released in 1995. She had served three out of those five-year sentence. She had remarried and moved to Louisville. 
She had died of natural causes on August 26, 2004. She was at the age of 54, and she was survived by her husband. Well, this is the end of this case. Do you think that double jeopardy should be abolished? And do you think the investigators should have made sure they had more evidence before arresting Melvin? Be kind in the comments, my friends. I'm off for another case for Monday. Thank you for being here. Bye.